Thank you um, to Boaz University for having me here. Um, as, as most of you know, actually, I am not, uh, I I've, I've didn't graduate, I didn't go to Boazici. I've never been uh, on the faculty at Boazici, um, but uh, I, I appreciate the invitation, um, and uh, I'm happy to consider myself as an honorary graduate of Boazici, if, if, uh, uh, if they'll justify my presence here. Um, and so thank you very much, um, especially president of university for, for the invitation. Um, the second thing I should say, of course, you know that I, I'm an economist, uh, and that means in this context two particular things. One is I need to use pictures. Uh, I feel virtually naked uh, without uh, some charts. Uh, so I'll make use, a few use of that. And the second uh, is uh, that uh, economics, as you know, is, the, is known as the dismal uh, science. Um, and so I will be true to type and, uh, and, and, and do my utmost to, um, to, to depress you um, <laughs> uh, as much as I can. Um, uh, so that I can I fulfill my professional obligation. But uh, let me begin with the, with the, with the good news. Um, the good news is uh, if we look at how the, um, uh, the Turkish economy has performed um, since the uh, start of the uh, uh, AKP government in 2002, uh, many of the, the headline uh, statistics are actually uh, quite encouraging. And Chalar here uh, uh, mentioned uh, uh, many of those, um, uh, as particularly with respect to uh, social uh, outcomes, uh, which I'll talk about uh, just very briefly. But if you look at, uh, for example, um, the rate at which the economy has expanded uh, in per capita terms, um, and you see that um, uh, except for that, um, that one dip, uh, which is really uh, was caused more by the global financial crisis rather than what was happening at home, uh, the income per head has increased by about 50% uh, since 2002. Uh, this is a lot less than what you often hear from government ministers, about 300% increase in income. Uh, which is simply not true. 50% is nothing uh, to, uh, to, uh, to scoff about. Uh, moreover, uh, you know, this is not just the story of, of an expanding economy, expanding average incomes. Uh, it's also that when you look at indicators of poverty and inequality, uh, there are some quite striking uh, gains as well. Um, this chart has uh, the, um, the Gini index, uh, which is, I guess, the, the gray um, uh, the gray plot, which you see sort of has generally tended down, although there has been an uptick, uh, slum, some increase in, inequal in inequality since about 2008. But perhaps the more, uh, the more uh, striking uh, figure is with respect to the, the poverty ratio, the poverty headcount, that's the uh, percentage of the population uh, that's below the here, the 2000 a day, $2 a day uh, benchmark, and that basically has more than halved uh, since uh, 2002. Uh, and and, and uh, sort of those are uh, all uh, things that have enabled uh, the kind of, of the, the expanding uh, mobilization of the country, the, the sort of, you know, the background of this, of course, is the rise of, in part, the rise of the, uh, the, um, uh, the Anatolian Tigers, uh, much more of the spreading of economic activity towards uh, um, uh, Anatolia. Um, now, uh, but we need to put all of this in a kind of a context. Um, and, uh, and we put this in the context of what was happening uh, in the rest of the world uh, during this period. Uh, um, the picture that we get um, is, uh, is, is somewhat different. What we need to bear in mind that this was a period that was good not just for Turkey, it was actually a period that was very good uh, for most emerging market economies and developing countries as well. Uh, so if we, um, for example, look at the gains uh, in per capita income uh, in Turkey compared to other countries. So what I've done here is simply uh, listed um, a, a wide range of emerging market and developing countries that we might think of as roughly as being the comparators uh, for Turkey um, and to see where actually Turkey um, uh, uh, lines up against them. You see sort of Turkey, um, I don't know if this probably doesn't have a pointer, but Turkey is the, 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 the dark red 
uh, column uh, in, in the middle, you see uh, an increase, the 50% the increase in, per, in incomes per head that I mentioned. Uh, but look at all the other countries that have actually done much better. Uh, obviously, China was the growth champion over this world this time. Uh, India was uh, uh, a, a second. But even if we leave India and China alone, we have Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Uruguay, Ghana, Argentina, Romania, Peru, Indonesia, Russia, Poland, Philippines, Colombia, Morocco, a whole range of countries that actually did uh, very well in this period, uh, and in fact, uh, better, uh, better than Turkey. This, this was a very permissive period in terms of economic growth, and I'll come uh, to the reasons why, in fact, it was particularly permissive uh, for the Turkish economy uh, in a second. Similarly, with respect to uh, measures of inequality and poverty reduction, in that respect, too, uh, it turns out Turkey uh, was not an outlier. Uh, Turkey's performance here, too, was more of a middling uh, kind of a performance. And not many people realize that um, essentially during the same period when inequality declined in Turkey, virtually every country in Latin America where inequality has traditionally been, has been seen as, as basically endemic, entrenched, very hard to change, virtually every country in Latin America has experienced significant reductions in inequality. Um, so there again, uh, the, the performance in Turkey is more sort of uh, in line with the, with the, with the usual uh, kind of, of comparators. Uh, so what does this you know, brief comparison tell us? Well, basically, you know, uh, what, this was a good time, uh, but what was happening in Turkey uh, was not an exceptional. Uh, there were common global forces that helped uh, raise uh, growth rates. Um, one of those forces, financial globalization in particular, uh, played a very big role, uh, the availability of cheap foreign capital. Uh, I think that was uh, extremely important. And with respect to um, the uh, reductions in inequality and the, re and the, inc and the reductions in poverty rate, uh, there were, in fact, across the world, a wide range of social policy innovations uh, that were being tried that proved quite effective. Uh, again, Chalar mentioned some of those in the context of, of, of Turkey, but these were in Turkish innovations. They were being, uh, they were being applied. Uh, many of them, in fact, originated in, in, in Latin America in countries like uh, Mexico and, and Brazil. Um, so I mentioned uh, financial globalization and cheap foreign capital in particular to see how this fits into the Turkish story of the last um, um, uh, 12, 13 years or so we need to understand how the Turkish economy works. Um, and to understand how the Turkish economy works, we have to understand one key feature of the Turkish economy that has always been the main obstacle, uh, the main barrier to high economic growth uh, in Turkey, and that is the problem of savings. Um, uh, if you look at sort of this is uh, a chart that shows you uh, the investment and saving rates. Uh, for the time being, just look at the right-hand panel uh, that shows uh, savings uh, in Turkey, again, against uh, a bunch of comparators. The national saving rates in Turkey is abysmally low. Uh, it's about, in, in 2013, uh, was uh, about 13% of GDP, which is extremely low. Um, and if you try to support a level of investment of about close to 20%, which that too is actually low for a kind uh, of a country like Turkey, what you're going to have is a very large gap between the investment and the saving. And where is that going to come from? It's going to come from uh, basically relying on, on borrowing. Okay? Now, this is in fact the, the traditional way, um, and by the way, the saving problem in Turkey has become worse over time rather than better. Uh, so that this is, if you look at the overall saving rate, uh, it's, it's trended down. Uh, and this is just the national saving rate. If we look at the private saving rate, it would look even worse. Okay? And that has to do something with the realignment of the private and public saving balances that I'll, I'll come to uh, just briefly uh, in a second. So if you have a country that is saving so low, uh, how can you grow? Uh, because after all, savings is what finances investment, and without investment, uh, you're not going to grow. Uh, what is the trick? How do you grow with, if you're a country that is, uh, that is saving so little? Uh, well, traditionally, the way that Turkey has managed this is through a policy of macroeconomic populism. Uh, macroeconomic populism is characterized by the fact that 
uh, you, you, you make up for the inadequacy of saving by borrowing. Uh, so you borrow to consume and invest, um, and uh, because short-term borrowing is typically cheaper, uh, and typically the creditor doesn't trust you much, they don't want to lend you long-term anyhow, so much of it ends up being of short-term uh, short uh, uh, maturity. Um, and that's fine as long as it goes, but of course the more you borrow, the more your growth is, is, is funded by, by borrowing, the more you're building up uh, fragility, uh, the more uh, you become uh, hostage uh, to changes in market sentiment, to market psychology, and you build up these vulnerabilities and fragilities, and often, of course, as Turkey knows from its uh, um, uh, economic history, ends up in crises of, of, of various kinds. Now, um, in its broad contours, uh, the story of the mechanism that drove Turkish growth in the last 12 years is actually no different. It's been a, borrow, it's been a borrowing finance growth, uh, but the AKP government essentially modified uh, this recipe of macroeconomic populism in two respects. Uh, first, uh, it's switched from uh, financing uh, spending from printing money to basically relying on uh, inflows from abroad, okay? Um, that's the first switch. Uh, so what that means is that, that basically uh, in, the, in the old times, uh, and the classic being the 1970s, when this macroeconomic populism got out of hand, the symptom would be that there would be inflation would be rising because you would be basically uh, printing money in order to finance uh, public deficits. Um, uh, the second uh, element uh, was that, in fact, the instrument through which macroeconomic populism was exercised is no longer uh, the public sector, so we're no longer talking about public sector deficits, but in fact it's the private sector. So it's the private sector that's going on a borrowing binge, on an expenditure binge, okay? Um, and let me just show you a couple of, of, of pictures to, uh, to drive home uh, both of those uh, points. Uh, one is the relationship between uh, the growth of the economy and the amount that it needs to borrow from abroad. Uh, so this scatter plot shows you the relationship between the growth, which is on the horizontal axis, um, and uh, the current account deficit, which is on the, uh, or the current account balance, which is on the vertical <laughs> axis. So the current account balance is a summary measure of basically how much you have to borrow from abroad, because it's a difference uh, between exports of goods and services and imports of goods and services. And if imports exceed exports, that has to be financed by borrowing from the rest of the world. Um, and uh, this shows that, that basically that Turkey has always depended on the, uh, being able to run large current account deficits, on being able to borrow in order to grow. Whenever the growth is high, uh, the current account deficit is very large. Whenever growth slows down, the current account deficit is, is smaller. So it's a very definite uh, um, uh, sort of negatively sloped relationship. But the closer you look at the scatter plot, there's something else you notice, uh, which is that every observation, every observation since 2005, that is for the last seven uh, um, or eight years, uh, is below the regression line, below the sort of line. So in fact, what this is, is that it's, a, uh, it's not just one relationship, it's really two relationships. Uh, one for the period uh, be before 2006, 2005 and, and before, and another one uh, for um, after 2006. Um, sorry. Um, and this downward ship in this relationship shows uh, how much basically the, the current account deficit has deteriorated for the same growth rate. So in order, to, in order to be able to grow the same amount as you have to after 2006, you have to run a current account deficit that's four and a half percentage points of GDP that's bigger, okay? Now, this, is, this worsening of the trade-off between growth and the external deficit is really quite a remarkable feature of uh, this new Turkish economy. Just think, this last year in 2004, 2014, 
uh, the economy had one of its worst years in terms of sort of normal time growth rate. Uh, that it was uh, the, the, in per capita terms, uh, growth was less than 2%, so by no means a good year. Even in that year when economic performance in 2004 was relatively bad, the external deficit, the current account deficit was 5.6 percentage points of GDP, 5.6%. Just so you put that in, into, um, uh, into context, in 2001, when Turkey had its financial crisis, the external deficit was 5% of GDP. Okay? So this is how much the, this trade-off, uh, the reliance on external capital, the reliance on large ex current account deficits in order to be able to grow uh, has become worse uh, in recent years. The second feature, uh, the second sort of uh, modification of the, of the strategy is the switch between who's actually going on a borrowing binge. Uh, remarkably, uh, it's no longer the public sector but it is the private sector. So here, if you look at the relationship between saving and investment, I mentioned before in the economy that saving is far below investment in the economy. Well, we can decompose that into the public sector and the private sector components. And that's what this does. So you look at the period before like the crisis uh, of 2001 or the couple of years after the crisis of 2001, you see the traditional picture in Turkey, which is the public sector that is running the large deficits. Uh, it's the, um, the blue line, which is in the negative territory. It's the blue line with the large deficits, excess of investment over savings, while the private sector, the red line, is running a surplus. Okay? And we see how this relationship has completely switched around uh, since around the middle of the 2000s. Um, and uh, now the public sector on balance is actually running surpluses, uh, but it's the private sector that is uh, actually this saving that is spending uh, more uh, than, than, than its income. Or to put it differently, it's, 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 its savings uh, is far, far below, uh, much more so than ever uh, compared to, to its saving. Uh, so it's a little picture to understand to make you see what's really happening in the Turkish economy and the kind of risks that it creates. Uh, you have a bunch of foreign lenders who are financing uh, this borrowing. Uh, it's intermediated uh, through domestic banks that are borrowing in dollars in short term. Uh, and then they own lend uh, to domestic firms, uh, to the corporates. Um, and uh, they're lending in dollars and Turkish lira, but they're lending in long term uh, to the domestic corporates. And in the process, uh, we're basically great getting two types of, of uh, risk in the economy. One is the, the standard maturity risk of the banking sector, which is that they're getting a lot of short term borrowing and they're making long term uh, uh, loans. Uh, but the part that is less well understood also is that there's a very significant foreign exchange risk build, be, built up uh, in the corporates, domestic firms, who are able to borrow in, 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 in dollar terms, uh, that they basically are borrowing uh, in dollar terms, uh, while uh, not all of them, a relatively small part of their actually earnings are, are in dollar, and so that's creating a uh, significant foreign exchange risk. Uh, and that sort of uh, open position, so to speak, is now about 20% of, of, of GDP. Uh, so the foreign exchange risk, if you will, in Turkey has moved away from the banks, which is, you know, the banks are relatively safe, uh, but it's moved on to the corporates, the firms, uh, which uh, is now bearing that, that risk. So, uh, how long can this go on? Uh, of course, we don't know. Uh, it all depends on expectations and psychology. Uh, so this is, you know, kind of, 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 of the you know, typical kind of, if you leave yourself hostage to financial markets, then you're basically hostage to the narratives uh, that are being told in the financial markets. On the one hand, if everybody expects Turkey to be growing rapidly, there will be lots of finance coming in at, uh, at cheap rates. Uh, low in, there will be low interest rates at home. There will be a strong currency. And then debt ratios will look very sustainable. That's more or less has been the story uh, until about a year or so ago. On the other hand, when if expectations turn around, if market, market psychology uh, uh, turns against you, then short-term finance dries up. Uh, that reduces both the growth rate of the economy 
and uh, creates continued uh, currency pressures towards currency depreciation. And with that story, the whole debt dynamics really become unsustainable. So various debt ratios today that look actually look very uh, respectable in Turkey could, could really move out of kilter uh, very quickly with continued currency depreciation and, and slowing growth, basically uh, a continuation of what we've been having. Um, so one way uh, out would be really to shift your growth model, but that's not going to happen. Um, we see instead uh, increasing symptoms uh, of this model of economic populism. Uh, we need to see this uh, shifting of the blame for negative outcomes onto various external enemies, the interest rate lobby, uh, you know, the, the sidelining of the, um, the relatively economically literate technocrats um, uh, of the government. Uh, we see, of course, this is now an ongoing problem, the intolerance towards the rule of law uh, with arbitrary interventions and unpredictability, and the increasing pressure to subjugate uh, the instruments of policy towards centralized control. So as Chala rightly mentioned, the government, the AKP government, inherited a bunch of, for example, good economic institutions, uh, independent regulatory institutions, which it proceeded to, um, to bring increasingly more and more under government control. And of course, the, the last citadel now is the central bank, uh, which is uh, also um, uh, reeling under tremendous uh, political pressure from, from the government as well. Um, so, uh, uh, my worry uh, is uh, that um, the truth and, and, and the story is now um, uh, has become increasingly um, uh, less and less uh, tenable uh, um, just by the way, like the political story, which you know, sort of the, the West sort of um, uh, uh, latched on to what happened in Gezi as if that was just a, uh, a watershed, but of course, anyone who was watching what was happening closely in the Turkish political system would have realized that the undermining of the rule of law and the deterioration of the political environment uh, is a much uh, uh, longer term, a much more structural story behind the AKP government. Um, and the trouble, of course, is that, that you know, any government, and this one in particular, is going to have a very hard time to resign itself to the kind of mediocre growth rates uh, that sustainable external deficits are going to require. And you have to bear in mind that unemployment is already fairly high, so there are lots of, there's going to be a lot of, of pressure. Um, final word, uh, I don't think the Turkish economy is going to experience the kind of crisis that it had in 1994, 2001, because all, both of those really uh, were the artifact of having a controlled exchange rate. Uh, and then you delay, you delay your exchange rate adjustment, the pressure builds up, and then for one day to the next, you have a major financial crisis that blows up in your face. Turkey right now is a floating exchange rate, which, mean, which acts as a, as, a, as a shock absorber. Already, as you know, the currency is depreciated by about 30%, but that sort of allows the economy to sort of uh, to handle these shocks in a much more, in a much smoother way. Uh, doesn't generate, doesn't bring the, the kind of growth that you would need, but it does mean that, that the economy at least isn't susceptible to that overnight financial crisis that, that it had in, in the past. Uh, but as I say here, uh, it'll sure, certainly looks like it's going to be a bumpy ride. Thank you. <laughs>